during the first millennium, and it just got started, was a very masculine religion. And it was distinguished by masculine traits. There are all kinds of reasons why that might be so. I don't want to get into the reasons, I'm just dealing with the reality. Uh, Christians thought of themselves as athletes, soldiers, warriors. Christian life was seen as going to warfare against the powers of darkness. It was a struggle. So if you were going to be successful as a Christian, you have to don yourself with the spiritual armor. You got to put on, get the spiritual weapons, and you've got to fight to survive. The great monastic saints were thought of as fighters. They were always, in the Catholic tradition, battling demons. In contrast, however, in the modern world, in the Western world, Christianity is now perceived as a religion of women. And uh, this is demonstrated by the fact that the predominant attenders at Christian service are women. And uh, the, the church is now seeking to adjust itself because in the past, you know, when the church was doing evangelism, it would win both male and female in equal numbers. But um, ever since I started the ministry maybe 30 years ago, I mean, up until the Lord trained me otherwise, I would preach and be baptized just with it. It's a scratch my head. It's an alarm of a man. But why is it I can't be man? <laughs> you know, and uh, but so the church is now adjusting itself, trying to make its institutions and its offices rightly reflect the people that we serve today. The Old Testament also abounded with imagery of maleness or manhood, especially when they were dealing with the church. And I said there are reasons for it, um, but I'm not dealing with the reasons today. I'm just dealing with the reality that that's how it was represented. And when you read the Bible, there are some things about manhood that stands out above all others. Maleness, maleness, maleness. Now, let me say there's a difference between maleness and manhood. Maleness is by birth. Manhood is by training. Maleness is by genetic code. Paternal chromosomes, my wife tells me, dictates whether you are male or female. But manhood is by design or development. My, my friend, Nevlon Meadows, um, who the last crusade I did, he was my associate, and his job was to do a man, I say a man, men ministry. That was his thing. And, and, and uh, he, I noticed that each evening, he'd start by saying, to become a man requires pain. To become a man requires pain, pain. It takes pain to become a man. I remember, Joan, when I was dating Southern Rose. I was at the seminary after leaving Oakwood, leaving her there as, a, as I graduated, went on to the seminary and got, got the idea that I really didn't want to be alone. And, and so I um, invited her up one weekend and asked her if she'd be my wife. And then it wasn't too long after that, my love, they said I went down to the Bethesda church where she had grown up, stand before Pastor Clement Murray, Chet Dameron, who was then was the um, the youth director at Andrews University. They did the service together, and, you know, dressed in I think it was a white tux, if I remember correctly. And and after saying a few words, they said to me, "You are now husband and wife." And I suddenly realized I was a husband. 
The problem was nobody trained me right. to be a right. Right. I just, you know, half an hour before I was just a single man. But I, I wake up now, I'm a husband, and I, and, I, and I went home to this woman who I, who I love, but I've never lived with before, and, and I recognize that I now have to train myself. Yes, it took some pain to become a husband. Now they said I was a husband, mm -hmm. but yet in the development to be a husband, it took some pain yes, and some adjustment. And sometimes I was wondering, oh God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> And that's the dilemma that male and men would have. Because they tell you you're, you're a man. But the problem is, until so I get married, you wake up and they say you're a man. But what does that mean? It takes some pain to become what they say you already are. In the book of Corinthians, Paul makes a statement concerning manhood. And in this statement, we can read certain things. He says, watch ye, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quits you like men. Be strong. Like men, be strong. What does it mean to be a man? Now, Paul says here, uh, you got to render yourself manly. Wow. And, and, and inherent in that, in the Greek there, is render yourself brave. So I assume that being a man meant to be brave. Yes. Yes. Now who teaches a boy how to be brave? But Paul says, like men, be brave. Show yourself a man. Don't be a coward. Don't be timid. Don't be alarmed by enemies. You gotta be bold and brave. You gotta similar phrase, you know. We say be a man or and today the boys say, man up. Alright, yeah. Man up. What does that mean, you know, to us men? Man up, be a man. Don't be cowardly. Now, now in today's society, there's a confusion of roles, gender roles. Many people don't know really what it means to be male or female. Many of us are confused as to who we are or what we are. We got confused women clamoring to go to the battlefield. And then we got cross dressing men clamoring to get into pantyhoses. <laughs> Homosexuality, lesbianism is in our schools and in our homes, yes. on our television, in our political system. Our president just placed it in the forefront by announcing that he supports gay marriage. You know, and, and our children are exposed to this thing from a very tender age. Yeah. Tell me, the Disney Corporation, which is the predominant producers of ch ch children's video, they got this as a big part of what they do. And, and so we are confused how to act. I mean, we, we, you know, when I was a boy, there were clearly defined roles as to what boys did and what girls did and yeah. what colors boys wear and what colors girls wear. But today, yeah. nobody's sure what is what. Yeah. And to stick to anyone and stick, we say we're stereotyped. Yeah. Yes. You see, but, but, but Paul here seems to suggest that manhood had some specific characteristics. And, and, and he wanted to bring these out, even though it was not his intention to bring these out, because in Paul's world, it was understood. There was no confusion about it. It was clear. And so he just states it, you know, as if this is the fact. Be, be, be alert, he said. In other words, be prepared. Now, this, this word that he uses means to collect, collect one's facilities and to be awake. The word he's using is that of a watchman standing on a wall as a sentry, scanning the horizon, making sure that everything is okay and that the army or, or, or whoever he's protecting is secure. That is, of course, in today's context, the family. So, so, so the man, and we're not even dealing with fatherhood or husbandhood, we're just dealing with manhood. The man has a responsibility to be a watchman for the family, whatever family to which he belongs. 
And, and he's always looking out to ensure that they are safe and secure. This watchman, according to Paul, was the first line of defense for this family or this city. Because if he's not alert, then somebody would come in and destroy. So he watches for danger. He loves his family. He loves being his brothers and sisters. If he's not yet married or his children, and he's their primary protector, and he doesn't allow anything to get in, to hurt, to harm, or to destroy. And so he says, you, manhood demands alertness, always watching. I. Sister <laughs> Lord, this is messing with me now. Manhood means always being alert, watching, looking out, trying to make sure that the people whom you are responsible for are okay. And so, you know, the, 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 the man who is married and has a daughter or a son is watching out for those who are around them, making sure that they associate with people who will not harm them seeking to get their attention to say, you know, maybe there are some places you don't want to go. Because if you go there, your life may be in danger. Your future may be compromised. Your ability to grow to become what you ought to be, God's plan for you, might not be achieved if you go in that direction. And, and so, so, so a man literally has the responsibility to, to, to communicate with those he protects. He's alert. The second thing that Paul emphasizes here is that he is dependable. Watchy. Be alert. Stand the facts. Be dependable. This was a, another military term that Paul was using. That we have no record of Paul being a soldier, but he seemed to admire soldier movies. <laughs> Like most men do. And um, the military was big in his mind. I gotta confess, if I wasn't a preacher, I think I'd be a soldier. I still had a dream. I was I was I was hoping that the, the US military would let me in as a chaplain, but they said I was too old. <laughs> when I came to my he's a praise the Lord. But but there's just something about the military that attracts men. And so Paul here is using a military term and he says be dependable. Be reliable. Stand your ground. Don't let anything push you out of the way. Don't allow the devil to break your ranks. Because once your army is divided, you will surely experience defeat. And Paul now is speaking about the families. Once the devil gets in there, gets between you, you've got trouble on your hand because the devil is going to divide and conquer. So he says, you've got to stand your ground. Don't let anything move you. That's right. That's all right, Rachel. That's all right. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, he's speaking again and he says, Therefore, my brethren, be steadfast. Yes. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. And so he, he, he connects this alertness with this firmness. An army on the watch is an army that is ready. An army caught off guard is an army that is defeated. No matter how much military power you have, if you're not firm and on guard, you're a loser. And then, 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 then finally, Paul says, after talking about being alert and being firm, he says, be strong. Yes. Like me, <laughs> be strong. <laughs> and so, in Paul's mind, there's no such thing as a weak man. If you're weak, you can't be a man. Men are strong. Like men, be strong. And Paul is not talking about physical strength. Right. There are right. some stories in the Bible that two comes to mind. Two boys, both born in Christian homes, reared in God-faring homes. Joseph and Samson. 
or trained by parents who loved God. But, but what a difference. One was the strongest man in the world, so reported. And if you've ever seen this movie, I don't know if Samson and Hercules, when I was a boy, that was a big movie. You know, Samson and Hercules waging battle. Uh, Samson is supposed to be the strongest, but yet, when you read the story, that's not what you get. He is supposed to be strong, but he's really not strong. In Genesis 39, Joseph finds himself away from home. His mama's and papa's training is not, is done now. He's a grown man, he's a young adult, and he's away from home. He doesn't have his mother and father there to watch over him anymore. But, and even though he had been sold into slavery, because of his upbringing and his training and, his, and the fact that he had God as the central theme in his life. And you need to understand that it really doesn't matter what context you find yourself in. When you have God as the central theme of your life, you're eventually going to rise to the top and have success. And so even though a slave, he rises to the top in his context and he has success. And in, in, in chapter uh, 39, verses 7 and 9, we have him experiencing a certain thing. The Bible says it came to pass. Uh, 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 after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. You can't blame the woman. He was a God-fearing, handsome young man. You know what I mean? If you're a God-fearing, handsome young man, some folks are going to like you. They're going to cast their eyes on you. You can't, you can't prevent that. That's just the way it is. The question is, how are you going to respond when they do that? And by the way, they don't really care if you're married or single. They don't. They don't. So, the, but the question is, how are you going to handle that? But the Bible says, uh, she said to him, "Lie with me, Joseph." But, but listen to this. He refused and said unto his master's wife, "He says, Behold, my master, what is not what is with me in the house? My master don't even know what he owns. He don't." That's how much he trusts me. He had committed all that he had in my hand. I am in charge of everything my master owned. There is none greater in this house than I. And that he's even telling the man's wife, not even you are as great as I am in this house. You see, he has not kept anything back from me but thee. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? Now notice something. In the world, in the world, if this was normally in the worldly context, somebody who had uh, got to the position that Joseph would have gotten would have thought it was his right to have that woman. Would have said, well, I've got everything else. I'm in charge. My master don't know what's going on. I am in charge, but not the Christian. You said there is something about the person who humbles themselves. The Bible says, you build yourself up, God will bring you down. But, but you are contrite to humble, and God will lift you up. That's what the Bible says. This boy says, I'm not going to mess with you, sister. Everything is in my hand. The man is holy and high in God, and I'm not going to touch that which is not his God. That is true strength. And I'm telling you, folks, it, it takes a real man to be able to do that because in this world, in this world, you've got all kinds of fight sisters who know every trick to mess you up. Yeah. Yeah. And they can back their eyes and throw you a smile that makes your stomach turn. I'm serious. Go ahead, I'll preach that. My wife might scared to hear it, but I've had some women in my life that I've got to go home. Because if I hang around, I might be in trouble. There's just something about them that, that they know what to do to get yes, to your head. Yes, yes. You see, and, and if you're not all prayed up and connected with God, yes. you know, you, you, might, you might mess up, but when, when you're talking with God, you, how can I do this great thing? I know what my body and my mind might be saying, but my relationship with God says something else. And a man is a man of courage who knows how to turn and run sometimes. Now, on the other hand, this other brother, grown up in a Christian home, uh, bred on the gospel, he says to his mother, you know, I've seen this woman down there, and she pleases me well. And I wonder 
You see, and, and then the next time, another time after messing up there, he felt he was so competent and strong that, that he's lying on this other woman's lap and she's making it clear that she's out to destroy him, but he really doesn't care because he thinks he's a man. He's strong. I can handle the light. I know you can. You got muscles, but she's got common sense. <laughs> I show you have a tricep and bicep, but she's got a brain that says she knows you're a man. She knows what you like, she knows what you need, and she'll give it so that she can put a hook in your nose and lead you around like a horse. And so if he had any say, if he was really strong, he'd get out of town. <laughs> See, when that woman grabbed the Joseph's coat, he left that coat and ran. But what Samson said, I can handle it. Yeah. Oh, he thought he was strong. Wow. See, he was physically strong, but morally weak. Yeah. Paul is talking about moral strength here. Yeah. The integrity stand in all context because you're firm. You're not going to be moved. The devil can bring on what he can, but you're standing on the rock Christ Jesus, and you're not going to let anything move. Yeah. That's what Paul is talking about. So to Paul, in this simple verse, being a man uh, meant that you had three characteristics. You, had, you were alert or watchful, you were firm or strong, and you were courageous. That's what Paul meant when he says, quick you like men. Now mind you, Paul is really not talking to men. Paul is talking to the church. And Paul is saying, brothers and sisters. If you are in Christ, there are three things you must demonstrate if you're going to be victorious. You've got to be alert. You've got to be firm. You've got to be courageous. If you don't have courage and strength and firmness, the devil is going to blow you around like a rag dog. He's going to toss you here and toss you there. He's going to punch you in the stomach here and knock you down. You won't be able to stand, but if you are alert, Every Christian, Amen. if you're going to win this battle, uh -huh. he says you got to be strong. you got to put forth all the vigor and energy which God only can give in maintaining and propagating truth. And as, 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 as you stand, your spiritual strength grows stronger and you are a better Christian. Watch ye. Be continually on your guard lest you be surprised by your enemy. So that's where the devil gets us sometimes. Uh -huh. The devil surprises us. Yes. A lot of times if we're thinking and we're ready, we won't fall to some of these things. Right. But he catches us off guard. Right. And so Paul says, Christian, you've got to be watchful all the time. You've got to recognize that you're a scout or a on your post. Don't let the enemy steal a march on you. See that the place that you're standing is properly defended. If the devil wants ground, don't let him take your ground. You've got to be alert. alert. And, and then he says, don't be disorderly. you got to keep your ranks unbroken. You've got to stay tight, stay close together. On your unity depends your preservation. If the enemy breaks your line, you are defeated. Quit you. Like men, Christians, be strong. When you're attacked, do not flinch. Maintain your ground. Press forward. Strike back. Keep compact, conquer, quit, you, like men, be strong. Now, Paul talks about the three characteristics of what a man ought to demonstrate. Alertness, firmness, and courage. But the Bible talks about what it takes to become a man. Paul talks about what you got to have if you are a man. The Bible talks about what you need to have if you're going to become a man. And I'd like to suggest today from the Bible four things, four things that a boy needs to experience in order to become a man. Four characteristics then of men. And uh, the first one we find in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. The Bible says that when Adam was made, God gave him dominion, dominion. 
dominion. It's nearly impossible to develop into manhood unless you have dominion over something. Dominion, you, the, 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 the boy, in order to develop, to grow from boyhood to manhood, and I told you already, Nevelon says it takes pain. You got to, you've got to learn dominion. You've got to learn to rule something, or to build something, or to develop something. If you don't learn to develop something, to rule something, to build something, then it's nearly possible for you to grow into man. You know, back in the days, you know, uh, boys would get out and they'd use their hands and build something. Yeah. And they, they started at a very young and tender age and you weren't even sure what they were building. But that, that seeing them working the dirt or, or working with the cans or working with the cartwheels when I, when I was a boy, you know, they, they literally make their own carts and yes. bikes and yes. car, all kinds of yes. great things. And, and we've stolen that from children. Yes. So everything is already made for them. And, and we give them praise God for the ones who learn to dismantle it. When, 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 when you've got a boy and you bring home this expensive whatever car oh, yeah. and that boy pulls off the wheels yeah. and breaks out it, that is what, what you want. That's a boy that's going to become a man one day. He's not comfortable just to see. He wants to know how it works. And so he breaks it down. And then when he breaks it down, he begins to build it back together. You see, and that's what you want. Somebody who knows how to have dominion over something. And God said to have, have dominion over this. Now you gotta understand, um, you don't know how amazing that was for God to say to Hannah, have dominion. See, God had dominion over everything. And, and these creatures that God was telling them Adam to have dominion over, they stood above him like a giant. Wow. I mean, you gotta think that a, 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 a Tyrannosaurus uh, came up to Adam and looked at that little thing, and Adam would command him, have dominion over him. He had no bullets, no guns, and weapons. All he had was that God blessed him with his mind. Yes. And yet he had dominion over all these huge creatures. Yes, he did. You see, so, so sometimes, you know, the brothers, and, and, and one reason the brothers sling guns in the hood is that they're trying to exercise dominion. You see, but unfortunately, that's not real dominion. You know what I mean? You know, anybody can boss anybody if you've got a gun at their head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even a fool who don't know how to fire the gun, you, if they stick it at you and you don't know them, you're scared. You have a right to be scared. Anyway, that's not real dominion, but, but, but when a man is using his mind and his brain and his intellect to be able to direct something or someone with a plan, that's what God is talking about. And so you've got to teach your son son's dominion. So it's important. It's important if you're going to have a boy. Don't try to break his will. All right, all right. Especially when they, 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 you know, they want to control everything. It's just the way it is. I, you know. and, and so sometimes that defiant boy uh, is a problem. But don't break his will. Because if you break his will, you better be breaking it for you. But eventually, that he's going to become a man, and somebody else is going to control that will. And so you want him to be strong, but now you need to be able to direct that will. Adam had to have sense enough to know whether in the perfect world he didn't have to worry about the Tyrannosaurus, but you know, after sin, if he messed with the Tyrannosaurus, it would eat him. So he didn't know he could have dominion over him. Common sense says there's a way to do it. You see, and so when you break somebody's will, they, they go mess with somebody, and then, uh oh, that's their aim. So you've got to teach them proper dominion, and to, to teach them proper dominion, to have common sense. To wield the power without having weapons, being right. weapons or all the other things the brothers use, it, it takes pain. Well. Because it requires wisdom and patience. But, but that's one of the things that um, God blessed Adam with. So if you're going to move from boyhood to manhood, you need dominion. The, the second thing you need if you're going to move from boyhood to manhood is you need productivity. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15 says, God gave Adam a job, an opportunity to be productive. Now, you know, there's a dilemma. There's a dilemma going on in today's world, in this, in this uh, cross-cultural, bisexual yes, world. Um, we have more and more brothers now who are staying home and taking care of the children and the wives going out to work. And um, you know that's that's now acceptable. And you know that makes good sense. It makes good common sense. But it doesn't deal with men. Right. 
doesn't, a, a, a man has a desire, if he's going to be a man, to be productive. And so we've got to teach our sons to be productive. They've got to learn. Now, I have a, uh, two sons. I'm blessed with two sons. But yeah. As she said, my, my, the Lord through my wife, and I must confess to you that one of the reasons I appreciate my wife so much is because of our children. Every time I look at them, I say, what a blessing. She blessed me. I used to hear people say that, you know. She blessed me with these beautiful children. Well, God blessed me with these beautiful children through my wife. And, you know, I was sitting down reflecting uh, just a few days ago. If I have to do this thing over again, this is our 27th year. 27th year. We've had many struggles. But if I had to do this thing over again, would I choose this woman? And i got to confess to you, I would have to choose this woman. Knowing what I know, even though it's not a perfect relationship, I wish it was, I would have to choose this woman. Because the nice things that I do have, I realize I wouldn't have if I didn't have her. And so to me, the nice things outweigh the issues. I would choose this again. So she's blessed me with, with two beautiful sons, but they are quite different, these two boys. 21, 26, but very, very different. See, I would bring my boys outside, and I wasn't the kind of father who pushed them around. They didn't believe in that. I had a father who, who was a good model mentor, and so I used him as my mentor. So if I was changing the car tires, I would bring my boys outside. I would never tell them to help me. I would just say, come outside, we're going to change the tires. Now one boy would be under the car, pulling the tire off. And the other boy would be standing up and talking us to death. <laughs> One boy, if, if he needed some money, he would get my books and go walk the streets and sell the books and come back and go get the other. If he needed some money, he would say, Daddy, can I have a dollar? <laughs> so, 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 so now when I'm dealing with these two boys, uh, one boy, you can get some, I don't give no money. <laughs> I don't volunteer any money for him. Even if he says, well, you know, Daddy, I'm broke. I say, but I'm not giving him any money. Because I know that his tendency is not towards productivity. And I've got to develop productivity in him. You see, and now mind you, if he's in trouble, I'm going to help him out. Because that's my responsibility as a father. But I nudge him to solve his own problems and to develop ways to be productive himself. The other, on the other hand, if he's if he says he's broke, more than likely, he's not going to ask me for any money. But I don't have a problem giving him any money. Because that's the way he is. And I mean, recently he was going back to Oakwood and you know, I was driving him back and I'm giving um, my daughter some money. And I said, well, do you need anything? He said, no, Daddy, I don't need anything. I got some. You see. And, and, and that's what you want to develop in your child. Productivity. And so I remember when I was at Oakwood, my friends would say, man... <coughs> One person I'll never worry about is Steve. Because anywhere he goes, he's going to make a living. Because he's always earning a dollar. Find some way to take care of himself. And that's what you want to hear in your boy. And, and, and I don't know if any of you single here, single here today. But um, if you've met, met some brothers and you have choices, I would suggest if you, if you see one who knows how to make a dollar, choose that one. Yes. And even if he doesn't know how to make a dollar, but he knows how to be productive. He's all, you know, some guys want to chill over and watch TV. Well, you leave him alone. If someone wants to do something with their time, that's the brother you want. That's somebody who's going to develop into a man. He's going to take your family and build it up. While others, well, without you, your family will be dead. Okay, so God made him productive. God gave him a job. The third thing, the third thing that a male need, and look, listen to me, folks. This one, I'm saying the others, this is the most important one that I'm going to tell you today. And that is a male needs a mentor. Yeah. A male needs a mentor. The dilemma we have in America, with, with especially the, the African American male, is that there are no mentors for him. And this is start, started a downward slide. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and folks, I'm not, you know, um, if, if you are if you choose, choose to be a single mother, be it accidental or intentional, you bring a male, a, a, a male into the world, understand, if he doesn't have a father, he's got a mental problem. It's, it's, it's nearly impossible. The greatest weakness 
of a black male in America is the weakness of not having a father, which is the issue is mentorship. It's not the title of father. Because we've learned if that black male has a strong male in his family who demonstrates maleness, he'll be all right. But if he doesn't, he's probably going to end up in jail. The number one, the number one characteristics of a black male in jail is a fatherless home. There is no, there is no other influence as strong that indicates whether he's going to have jail or success than just not having a father. Now, if you know that and you're a black female, you understand why. You, you probably don't want to bring a, a male into this world without a father. Because the rec doesn't matter if he's in, if he was born in high society or in poverty. Just not having that male figure is the strongest indication as to whether he's going to go to jail or not. That's a statistical fact. He needs a mentor. Now, we take this thing for granted, but in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10, the Bible says, Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. God was Adam's mentor. Every day, God came by. Now think about it. Every day, I mean, God is God. He's got all kinds of things to do. He's got worlds to stop from colliding because the devil is busy. He's got empires to stop from caving in because the devil is busy. But yet, God had an appointment with this man every day. God come and walk with Adam in the cool of the day because God was demonstrating to Adam what he wanted Adam to be. Adam could look at him and see him and observe him and know that's what I want. And Adam would grow to be like God. I love the Spirit of Prophecy says, you know, the day was going to come had Adam continued to walk with God every day where God would pull Adam close, look him in the eye, and say, Adam, you are like God. That's what mentorship was to do, to demonstrate what Adam was to be. But unfortunately, you know, something happened. And every male needs a mentor. Now, folks say, you know, um, preacher, what is it that you think in your life? that made you successful? And I would answer unequivocally, a father who spent time with me when I was a boy. My dad was always there. And, and, and everything he'd do, you know, my dad was one of those manly men who, you know, he, he liked to do the, the men things. And I wasn't at all intrigued by the men things. I didn't like sports. My dad wanted to play cricket and soccer, and if, if the sport exists, you know, you gotta, if, if you go to my house, when my father came, and you know, we grew up in Jamaica, when my father came to New York, I mean, he was an Islander fan. He said, you learn hockey, you didn't say hockey. But if it was a sport, my, my dad had a trophy and a cup or a jersey, because he loved it, that was it, you know. I'm talking about, about cars, he loved to pull cars apart and to fix them back and incorporate anything you name it, he wanted to do it. And when he did it, I had to go along. No, no, I understand. Um, in our home as we lived, I happened to have an older brother, but he didn't live with us. And so uh, before me was a sister, and after me, there are three <laughs> sisters. And so I was like a single boy in, 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 this, in this home filled with women. But, but, but whenever my dad was doing anything, I had to go and I had to do it. 